All right, hello, good morning. Welcome to my session. Thank you to Pizetagogy for letting me be a part of this once again. I really appreciate the opportunity and I love the Phys Ed Summit, so I wanted to keep going. Um, my name is Adam Metcalf. I'm doing a session today on streamlined feedback to enhance assessment in standards-based physical education. And I've done this session uh, on two occasions, once in Asheville at the National PE Institute and then I just did another one in November at the Illinois uh, AFERD convention. Um, just to give you a heads up that this presentation is not really for beginners. So I'm, I'm hoping that most of you have a background in standards-based uh, physical education, grading, instruction, and whatnot. And you're already sold on standards-based being the best practice uh, for assessment and feedback. Um, so this presentation is going to go sort of a little bit beyond the, the basics as far as ways in, in which you can implement it. Um, just to give you a brief background on myself, from Waterloo, Iowa, I've been teaching for 12 years now and I live in Elk Grove Village, which is in the suburbs of Chicago. I teach in Downers Grove and uh, I have a business background. So I have marketing and uh, management information systems. So uh, pretty savvy with uh, spreadsheets and, and data tracking as far as that goes, which helps me in uh, implementing a standards-based approach. The objectives of this presentation are going to be uh, a little bit about the why, so describing the components and considerations of a standards-based approach, but more than anything, I'm really gonna focus on how. How do we implement it? So I'm gonna share ideas of translating a standards-based approach into a traditional grading uh, system. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult for the middle and high schools to implement standards-based when their schools do not. So um, I'm going to show you some ways in which you can do that. And I'm also going to demonstrate some ways to use technology to provide purposeful and timely feedback to students. That'll be towards the end of the presentation. Um, I've found that some teachers are really into that and some teachers sort of get glazed over uh, because it is pretty uh, geeky as far as tech goes. Um, but we'll get into that. Um, so in my standards-based approach, um, I had to go rogue on this. So my, my uh, school does not use standards-based. And about seven years ago, I sort of started my journey uh, to figure out how I could start to do this uh, at an elementary and middle school level because I teach at a K through eight uh, independent school. Um, so I wanted to figure out ways that I could provide timely and accurate feedback to my students. Uh, as far as standards-based instruction, all lessons should be focused on what sh students should know, understand, and be able to do. Um, and this is just sort of the basics of a standards-based approach. Most of you probably already know this, but um, learning is the main objective, not a time frame. Uh, retakes uh, on anything, so that could be physical, cognitive, whatever it is, uh, are encouraged so that students can show you, hey, I I'm, I'm starting to get this. Uh, for full credit. We need to understand that grades are communication. Uh, we will never be taken seriously as a content area unless we establish our program based in student learning. Uh, that is so important to keep in mind. Uh, we need to communicate that learning determined by evidence, it must be criterion based, uh, and the feedback is to the students is how well are you mastering the content. Specific to the grade level outcomes, and I use Shape Americas, um, because we have a lot to do. I mean, there are a, a lot of grade level outcomes um, to establish a, a child's physical literacy, and we need to stay focused on that and, and try to build the joy um, between the movements and the concepts that we're talking about for overall well-being and make it meaningful for, make it meaningful for the students. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna get into uh, the nuts and bolts of the, the approach that, that I take, and, and it's, a lot of it's based on perceived competence, knowing um, you know, what, what the skills should look like and being able to accurately judge their own performance um, so that they can be a, a competent mover. So using a backwards design approach um, is the beginning of, of this process. So if you haven't begun to put together a um, standards-based approach, here's where you start. So basically you take a look at your your grade level and you can do this within your department. And it's actually kind of fun. So you go through and you look at, okay, for my students, my population, which are the most important? Uh, when Shape America first came out with the grade level outcomes um, five or so years back, 
I was a little bit overwhelmed. You know, I was sort of a standards referenced approach where, yeah, I do that. I do a little bit of that. I do a little bit of this, but this is not that you're, you want to look at specific priority outcomes. So these are the ones that are most important. Uh, I didn't really know how many to choose. I was like, okay, wait, what do we do? 20, 30. Um, but um, I was watching, I think it was a, a phys ed uh, phys ed summit once and um, Bernie Holland said, just pick 10, pick 10 for the year and really focus on that. Does that mean that's all you teach? Absolutely not. Um, you can, you know, sprinkle in, you know, other uh, standards along the way, but it's not the ones you're focusing on. So uh, that's really key in establishing uh, from a teacher's perspective that, yeah, you might not be assessing uh, short handled implements in, you know, not until, you know, fourth grade. Does that mean you don't do it until fourth grade? Absolutely not. So if you can get those children using paddles in kindergarten, first, second grade, their competence is going to be established. Even though you're not assessing it, you know, let them have some experience with it. That way they can, you know, build their skill level. And by, by fourth grade, then you're finally able to assess, okay, are you, are you competent in this particular skill? So here are the resources and samples for this presentation. Um, there's the website that you can click on and it has, it's a Google folder and it has everything in there that, that I'm gonna present, including this presentation. So you can click on the links and take a look at the samples and, and use it, and, you know, make modifications to it. Um, but I'm gonna show you some things here uh, in this process. Um, starting with selecting priority outcomes. The best way to do this is to print it out and then, you know, paper, pencil, circle it. But you can see, um, you know, the, the grade levels, you know, throughout the um, years and then the strands. Uh, the ones that are highlighted in color, um, after we, you know, circled our priority outcomes, then we went and kind of color coordinated the, uh, the spreadsheet to, Make sure that you know we're hitting on the ones that that we really want, and that there aren't any major gaps um, in our program. So this is uh, standard uh, four or five um, along the way from from K to five. So we wanted to make sure we hit on most of those strands at some point. Um, this is an example. I know it's hard to see, but in in the resources you can take a look at this. Uh, this is my sample course description uh, for seventh graders. Um, it establishes, you know, the units that we're going to be doing and the outcomes that are going to be assessed. At the bottom is the uh, standards-based approach, and I'm going to get into how you can do this at your school here. So as far as the descriptors um, for psychomotor, um, here's what I am currently uh, okay with, and this is what I currently believe, but that might change in a year or so. I'm always tweaking the verbiage. Um, and that's up to you as well. If you want to take some of this and use it or, or change it, that's totally on you. Uh, but if you look over on the right hand side here, the four, three, two and a half, two and one, that this is the sort of the standards based scale that I like at this point. Uh, proficient, competent, uh, that's the level we want our students to be at. Proficient um, is just that higher level, um, more advanced uh, level of understanding. Um, but Below that is, is where the students are as far as developmentally. Uh, and then for a traditional grade, um, like in middle school and high school, reporting at 190, 85, 80, and 60. Uh, I don't give anything below a 60, and I omitted 70 a couple years ago because it was just too many levels. Um, so uh, these are what I currently use, and, and I'm pretty happy with the results so far. Um, again, for the descriptors, um, cognitive, knowledge-based things and effective, um, you know, standard four and five, uh, things about attitude, value, and emotion. So when you are uh, forced to use a traditional grading approach as I am in, in middle school, and I know a lot of high schools are, then it gets a little bit tricky. So here's the way that I was able to adjust it in my particular student information system at the time. So I turned all my, my uh, assessments or, um, that I was entering in the grade book, I turned the category weight off and then the assessment weight on. So I don't know if that means anything to you, but that's what I did. Um, and I'm establishing a grade for each GLO. So 
every priority grade level outcome that, that I selected, that's what I'm assessing on. Now, some grade level outcomes, you only need one assessment on. And th that will show you, you know, this student meets that need. So if you're turning assessment weight on and you're entering a grade on that one specific um, grade level outcome, then the weight is 1.0. Now, a lot of grade level outcomes <clears throat> need more than that. So if you have two assessments, maybe they're performance and a cognitive test, and you want to you know, see what that looks like um, when you merge those together, um, you might weight each one at you know, 0.5. And some, some of the other ones need three um, or, or four. So as you can see, you're just sort of dividing up that one that 1.0 into as many different uh, bits of evidence that you need based on current performance. So some of the stuff earlier in the uh, term, you can sort of disregard. So wh where are they at this point? And it could be performance, a cognitive assessment, and a, you know, a written essay reflection um, to let you know, okay, this student gets it at this point, or you know, they're not quite there yet. Uh, as far as heart rate monitors, um, we call it, I know it's hard to see there, but Exploring Fitness is the system that we use for assessing evidence of learning. So what we do is we give the students uh, a choice when they have heart rate monitors on, um, on these Exploring Fitness days, they get 30 minutes and their expectation is to get uh, in their target heart rate zone. And we are trying to get as many minutes as we can in that particular session. And we do seven sessions per trimester. And we throw out the two lowest scores. So uh, in establishing if a student meets expectations, we take that um, 190 and so on scale and we break it down uh, into minutes out of 25. So the student gets 30 minutes of activity and their goal is to get uh, 25 total, 25 minutes in the zone. So they have some time to get warmed up and take breaks as needed. It's not um, you know, overly difficult to, for these students to get in that zone and stay in that zone. Um, and they get to choose what they want, so they love it. Um, and if you take 90% of 25, you get 22 and a half, so that's 22 and a half minutes, uh, is good enough. That, that's where I would expect the students to be. Uh, if they're getting below that, then you know, that 20 out of 25, that's an 80, so you're getting, uh, um, you know, they're starting to get there, but maybe they you know, weren't quite feeling it that day. And if it's below that, I'm not going to give them anything lower than a 15. So um, I'm going to communicate that they're not quite there. Even if they got two minutes in the zone, they get uh, 15 out of 25 in the grade book. Um, and then after seven sessions, I throw out their lowest two scores and I use the um, those their five best scores to establish, okay, these, the student can work in this zone or not. And I offer makeups, as many makeups as they want. Um, if we're doing uh, badminton and they need to make up or they, they prefer to make up their exploring fitness um, by running stairs or whatever it is, then they, they can certainly choose that. It's whatever they need at that point in time. Um, if they wanted to boost their grade, maybe they, had, they were absent for three or four days or they, uh, just their heart rate monitor wasn't quite working right or whatever it was, they, they can make it up as many times as they need to. So when you are trying to represent a standards-based approach in a traditional uh, letter grade uh, report card, there's a few different ways to do it, but the way I uh, really was sold on is the Marzano method. And I came across a, a video on YouTube that uh, was a really simple explanation of, of how to do it by Matt Townsley. Um, and basically, if, if you do have you know, your standards for the marking period, uh, and you have the four, three, you know, two, one, whatever scale that is, you average each one of those. So each of these is a grade level outcome. And if you only have, you know, five or six that you do in a, in a term, or even three or four, first trimester or whatever it is, then you only average those ones. So if you, if you don't quite get to, uh, you know, very many in a trimester, then, then those are the ones you report on. So when you average whichever ones you do, so in this example, there's 10, you average those together and come up with a 3.8. Uh, this is a very simple scale. Mine's a little bit different. I'll show you that in a second. But within that range, it gives you a nice, easy letter grade. So um, this is the method that I use, uh, but I've changed um, some of the 
uh, cutoffs as far as I'm concerned. So you can see along the right side here, uh, Marzano suggests that these are sort of your, your cutoffs for, for the established grade. Here are mine, um, very similar, uh, except for you know, I'm a little bit easier uh, to get an A on. Um, and then a lot of them down here, you know, they match up pretty closely. But A plus is, is the highest grade at my school that you can get and then down the way. Um, so when you're converting and, and averaging these grade level outcomes that you've assessed, um, then you have to sort of you know, portray that in whatever system that your school uh, uses. So taking those and, and using the data uh, to, to establish in your professional judgment um, what grade the student should receive. Uh, and again, if it doesn't quite look right, then it's up. You can change it. You're the teacher. You're in charge. You shouldn't, you know, use this as a mathematical guide uh, to help you use your professional judgment. But if you think that a student's grade should be, you know, a notch above or, or whatever, then you can do that as well. Um, and I do that from time to time, where I know a student uh, should be receiving uh, a slightly higher grade or you know the right where they're at so use this as a guide uh, for your professional judgment uh, when you're looking at the standards that you should assess and, and this is really important to provide balance um, a lot of times you'll get uh, the question about oh don't all the uh, top athletes have an advantage in this approach uh, not necessarily if you choose a balanced approach where you are assessing you know some psychomotor skills and then you know some fitness components and then some of the affective domains every unit then it really gives a balanced uh look to your feedback and your grades it really paints the right picture that it should so um this is an example of so these are standard one uh grade level outcomes standard two uh grade level outcomes standard three and then four and and five so notice that i'm, I'm doing three psycho uh motor skills but I'm also doing uh, five of the affective domain. So things that uh, are, are observed, things that are uh, determined by written reflection, um, and then you know fitness stuff in there. So this is just one particular uh, grade where you know I'm. These are the ones I've chosen, but it's very very balanced uh, so that when I'm reporting that it's that it's fair for all and. Um, if you need help with that along the way, just reach out. I can kind of show you. And, and there's also examples in in the um, the resource folder that I'm sharing with everyone as well. Um, this is what it would look like in an online gradebook. So um, I've only this is just one student, but uh, it would be a little overwhelming if I had my whole class list. But uh, in this same example, and if you go back, you can see at the bottom that this student would receive a 2.73 or a, a B with their uh, average grade level outcomes. But if you're doing this on an online grade book for middle or high school, and you're, you're plugging in those 90s and 100s and 80s along the way, this is how it will shake out. And this is why I had to do both versions to see how close I was with these calculations with the Marzano method. So if I'm plugging in 90, 90, 90, um, it's gonna give me um, an average for my, for my standard one stuff, and then so on and so forth. My standard two, uh, this would be my standard three. Again, I talked about the um, exploring fitness way that we assess that. So each one of these is one of those sessions. And again, you can see this is out of 25 currently because of the minutes. It's just easier for my students to see, oh yeah, I got 24 out of 25 minutes. Um, so, uh, and then also you can do, you know, your cognitive set assessments with uh, like skeletal system, but notice down here, the weighting. And I talked about this a little bit earlier. This has a zero weight. And the reason it has a zero weight is because it is not one of my priority outcomes. I just want them to learn it, but it's not part of their overall grade. You can see that the point two is because there's five pieces of evidence for this one particular grade level outcome. Down here, you can see that there are 0.5 for each of the grade level uh, things. And then, you know, things that were assessed only once, that would be a 0.1. Again, when all those are graded out, it is an 87.51, which gives them a B for the course. 
And again, it matches up with this version, also a B. Um, so if you're looking at converting uh, from standard space um, to traditional, that's the way that works for me. Um, and you can certainly apply or uh, tweak anything that you need to. So right now I'm gonna get into some cognitive uh, assessments and there's a lot of these things you probably already know, but you know you can use just any way to, to inform yourself uh, what do the students know and understand and figuring out the most efficient way to do it in your class. So it might be using a whiteboard and holding it up or uh, you can use Plickers or Kahoot. A lot of times those things take a little bit more time than we have. So whatever is the most efficient way for you to gather evidence uh, with your current situation, class sizes, you know, prep time and all that. Um, Self-evaluation is huge for me. I want the students to build an accurate perceived competence. So the way I do that, uh, BAM video delay with iPads on tripods, you can set a, a 10 second delay, let them perform an activity uh, or a skill, and then they can watch themselves do it and see what changes they need to make. I love this picture down here at the bottom because if this child had no idea what he was doing wrong with jump rope, um, he, he wouldn't be able to improve. And we all know that, take a look at how high he's jumping, he's gonna get super tired. And the reason he's jumping so high is because his arms are up and out, which is uh, raising the level of the jump rope. So he needs to understand that um, if, if he brings his elbows in closer, he doesn't have to jump as high. These are a few examples of just ways that you can just uh, get a quick little self-assessment from the students, they can hand it in and you can see, okay, are they, are they accurate or do I need to have a conversation about uh, a particular skill and sort of what the expectations are. So uh, a lot of the times they're pretty accurate with their self-assessment, which, which is great. Um, more self-assessment stuff, uh, this is for a little bit higher, uh, higher level thinking. Um, and then at the bottom, so if I'm, if I'm doing a cognitive uh, assessment for students, a lot of times at the bottom, I'll, I'll have a, a, also a self-assessment. How well do you know the components of fitness? So at the end of the test or the, the assessment, how do I feel about how well I know this stuff? And it can be, wow, got it, getting there or not yet. And again, that, it just tells me if, if they got uh, you know, two out of 17 uh, and they said that they are a wow, then there's something up there. They're, they're really not getting it. Um, as far as data tracking on the go, uh, I used to use uh, Idacchio and I had grade books and there was tabs and I put a lot of work into it. Uh, the thing I found cumbersome is that if I was assessing a, a live class, being able to do that on an iPad was not efficient enough for me. I wasn't getting uh, enough of the data from what was going on in the class. So I sort of set that aside and went back to a, a clipboard and a printed sheet and I was able to just use a you know pencil or a pen and check off um, student performance a lot more efficiently than I did with iDocchio. But if you're using that and it works for you, uh, that's all good. So here's an example of one of those sheets that I would have on my uh, clipboard, ones that are in color coded already. Uh, that would be maybe at the end of first trimester, I had their established grade and I just printed it out so that in second trimester, if they, the student performance changed, I would be able to just to write over the top of that. Anything in yellow, I would really pay close attention to those students and see if they're getting it or see what I can do to help them you know, raise their performance. So if you can see the written ones, that's the more current grade that, that I've been observing. So I usually will update that and then print it out every once in a while. Uh, I don't really have an established uh, time frame for when I print these out. But again, I'm always looking for the most current performance uh, to give communication and feedback uh, to those students. Uh, when you're looking at cognitive assessments, again, summative, uh, you know, online quizzes. So at the end, and, and a lot of times I'll do the cognitive assessment uh, if we're getting into a sport unit at the beginning of the unit. Um, so for example, like a floor hockey uh, quiz, just to make sure that they know, you know, things about safety um, and where they can and can't go in the court and um, you know, knowing the, the established rules. If they bomb on that at the beginning of the unit, then hey, let's spend some time with those specific kids, letting them know he, here's the rules or here's what we expect for floor hockey. And then when they get into games, they have uh, a lot more confidence that they're, they're doing it right and they don't tend to shy away as much. 
So Google uh, forms and quizzes are, are a good way to do that. Um, if it's like a fitness concept uh, test, I let them take it in a Google form first, submit that quickly, and then they're able to join in uh, in whatever we're doing for that particular day. Uh, and then if they want to retake it, and if, if they bomb on it, then I, I encourage them to retake it. Uh, but they have to use a paper pencil and they have to study. I have booklets that, that have the concepts in it. So they'll study for a little bit and they'll retake it. A lot of times, you know, on the first retake, they're, they're good to go. Um, but sometimes it takes two or three times uh, with the paper pencil, but eventually they get it and they, they own that knowledge uh, from there on out. Um, also journal reflections, I, I, I use those. And here's an example of a, of a question. I, I'll usually paint the picture of what they've done so far and then ask them a pretty direct question regarding the uh, grade level outcome. Uh, and I'll usually put that code right in there, letting them know, hey, this is important. And, and I tell the kids that if you see a code like this, this means it's a national standard that you're being assessed on. And I, I really wanna know your thoughts because I, you know, I, I don't know what you're thinking unless you type them or write them out. So uh, again, um, this is a, a way to assess the student's uh, understanding um, in, uh, in those affective domains uh, with, with reflections. All right, so this next portion of the presentation, some of you are going to absolutely love and some of you are going to be like, this dude is crazy. So um, just prepare yourself. I won't be offended if you, uh, if you give up on this right now, but these are some things that I do um, in my program and for my students, especially in middle school, uh, to give them timely and accurate feedback. So. Um, these little videos that I'm going to show along the way, they are really chopped down. There are full tutorials uh, on YouTube that you can uh, visit that are about 15, 20 minutes in length that show you step by step how to do some of this stuff. And most of these uh, are really leveraging the power of a Google Chrome add on called Autocrat. And I'll, I'll show you how that works here in this first example. So take a look. And uh, this is how I set up peer assessments. So during a sport unit, uh, and I use a sport ed model approach, um, these students are assessing their teammates and themselves on four uh, particular skills. So here's what that will look like. This video will demonstrate how to distribute data from peer assessments to students more easily. When creating the Google Form, I have a spreadsheet list beside the Google Form editor. Create one multiple choice grid using the categories from the sport in which I want to evaluate along with a one, two, three, or four. Then you just change the student name at the top as you duplicate each one for your entire class. This step takes the longest, but once it's done, it's done for the school year. Once you share out the Google form to the students, they then fill out the form for only their teammates for that specific unit based on current performance they skip all the rest of the students who are not their teammates or themselves. Once they submit the data, it comes into the response sheet. To process the data, you copy all the data from the response sheet into the merge template. You paste the values only at first into the blank sheet. Then you have to highlight that data one more time, copy it, and then paste it as a transpose. So you right click, into the blank space below and you select paste special paste transpose this transpose data is key for being able to process the data more effectively to process the data you copy the transpose data and paste it into one of the transpose data calculators right click special paste values only when this data goes in you should be able to see all the students' data, and then if you scroll all the way to the right, you'll see some formulas that will give you mean, mode, and standard deviation. Mode is my preferred measure of central tendency for peer evaluation. If the data is skewed, I plug in my own data on the columns in order to get the mode that I would prefer. Rather than sending this data to students as numbers, you can create statements associated with those numbers. You sort the blank cells out and you can see each statement for students. Statements are for psychomotor and affective domains. Once you are happy with the data that you have processed, 
you copy that data from the calculator into the AutoCRAT Merge tab. You paste the values only, and then you can run an AutoCRAT Merge to merge the data with a Google Doc template that you have created. My current Google Doc template looks like this. When you're ready to run your mail merge, then you go through the AutoCRAT wizard, making sure your file settings are what you want them to be, naming the files, PDF or Google Doc. The last step in the wizard is to share this as an email. You create a statement to each student, letting them know that this is feedback based on current performance. When you save it and then run the mail merge, it will create an email that looks like this with an attached PDF or Google Doc that gives the statements about their current performance in the given sport. So as you can see from those peer assessments, I know it's a lot to, to take in, but um, this visual shows you that once you sort of get the, the, the basics of this process down, you can give timely feedback in about 12 minutes. So uh, the students take about 90 seconds or so to assess themselves and their teammates based on current performance. And I usually, uh, if, a, if a unit is three weeks long, I usually will have them do it in the middle of the unit and then one more time at the end of the unit so that students can get feedback to make changes along the way, and then it gives them sort of a summative um, uh, assessment at the end of the unit based on their performance in those four categories. So for example, invasion games, advancing the ball, uh, supporting teammates uh, when you're off the ball, defending space, and then you know, your overall sportsmanship, uh, how good of a teammate you're, you're being. So um, again, I like to do that twice per trimester, based on a small group, maybe five or six students that each person is, okay, thinking back, how did this student perform in these areas? Uh, and they just give their objective feedback to me, you know, and I process it and turn it around, like I said, in about 12 minutes or so. Uh, and the kids really enjoy uh, getting those because it, it, it lets them know that, hey, they're, they're on the right track or, or there's some things that they need to work on. Uh, this next thing I'm gonna show you, again, it has a, there's a blog tutorial for this and you are welcome to dive in uh, and, and change or modify anything that, that you would do. But this is an example of what one of those sheets would look like that the students would get emailed to them. Um, the next way, and this works pretty well in net games, a uh, formative assessment called game performance assessment instrument. So rather than thinking back to how a student's been performing, this is one particular game. How is this person doing right in front of me? I am looking at one person, and I am assessing them live. And at the end of that game, I, my, I tally my marks and then I enter it into uh, an iPad. And what this does is it takes the formula uh, from the efficient, inefficient movements, appropriate and inappropriate um, movements, say within a game of badminton, and then it gives them sort of a score. And I'll show you how that works here. Um, and again, this, this really has worked well uh, for giving the students just sort of a, a snapshot of how they perform. So um, they have a printed, they have a printed list of students. And before class, I'll let them know that, hey, we're doing some performance, uh, game performance assessments. If you do not want to be uh, included in this, then you can just go cross your name off. So some students are like, I don't really want to be, it makes me nervous, I don't want to be assessed in this way. Um, so. Uh, if they don't want it, they can just cross their name off and I'll use the rest of the list to assign students who are not playing, uh, you know, someone that they are watching to, for, to uh, give feedback to. You can see down on the left here, these are games of badminton and these folks that are sitting on the floor, they are watching one person. The person, you know, they can probably figure it out sometimes, but they don't know who, who the assessors are watching. They're just playing their game uh, as they would normally do and their um, assessor is taking a pencil, pencil and paper and tallying those numbers. When the game is over, they you know, walk their data over, they enter it into an iPad uh, form, and then they submit that. Within 20 seconds or so, the students will receive an email uh, based, on that, um, based on their performance in that game. Um, and if, again, if you want to know more about this, you can certainly uh, look into the resources. There's a full tutorial on YouTube on this as well. Um, but it'll give them something that looks like this. And it tells them their overall, you know, the raw data. And then 
it does the calculations for them so that they don't have to do all the math involved. Um, the next thing that I will show you here is a Shape America standards based progress report. So if you're not happy with your school's report card um, because it doesn't, you know, translate the meaningful learning that you've established in your class, this is a great way to sort of supplement that with a progress report. Um, this uh, progress report was established a few years back by a, a pretty savvy uh, report task force. Some of these folks I know and I highly respect. Um, and when this came out, I was really excited because this gave a, you know, a one to two page snapshot of what I was really looking for rather than what my report card said. So I took that data and I, and I made a, um, an autocrat merge so that my students could, to, could get one of these uh, progress reports uh, as, as often as I wanted to, to send them. So here's what this looks like. Using this Google Sheet along with a Google Doc template, this video will demonstrate how to create a progress report. The grade level outcomes are, are across the top and the students are in the rows. This is the Google Doc template. The evaluation key along with any of the verbiage can be changed, modified, or edited. The items on the template that have the brackets around it represent the column headings from the Google Sheet. To run this merge between the spreadsheet and the Google Doc, you'll need to download an Autocrat add-on to Google Chrome called Autocrat will take you through a wizard and you'll have to set up your own parameters for the mail merge. You'll have to select the correct Google Doc in which you want it to speak to. Then you click Next, select the correct tab, what you want to name the file, what type of file you want to create. Then you'll select the correct destination folder that you want the documents to go into. And you have the option to send an email. You can attach it as a PDF or a Google Doc. Uh, the brackets again represent the column headings. So you can customize your statement to each student. When you're ready, you save, and then you want to run the mail merge. So you click play. It will take a few minutes to merge all the data that needs to be merged. It'll create four new columns to the right of what you currently have set up. And then as it creates each document, you'll see it on the right in all those columns start to generate. The end result looks like this. So this is an example of an email that was sent to a student, the statement I created with the attached document. The attached document is the Standards-Based Physical Education Student Progress Report. It has each standard that was assessed per trimester and the standards-based score along the right for trimester by trimester. This is all tied into the Excel spreadsheet, so whatever data is in there, that's what it merges with. As I mentioned before, this is completely customizable. So you can put in as much or as little data as you want into the spreadsheet. This is another example of another student's progress report. You can see at the bottom that there are average grade level outcome scores that are converted into the traditional letter grade. So as you can see, that is one way that you can build a progress report from a spreadsheet and communicate that in you know, a somewhat timely manner. A couple times uh, a year or uh, you know, once a trimester it is fine for that because I know it's a lot of data to process and then getting that to the students uh, in addition to your, your regular report card. So uh, that is yours to explore if you want. The last thing I want to show you is how to supplement your report cards using narrative uh, statements and uh, like a paragraph for each student. So this is something that my school, we have to do. So uh, when you have as many students as physical education teachers have, it's really hard to say the exact right thing about you know, so many um, students. So this is a way to sort of take um, statements that are really thought out and selected. And again, you can use mine if you want or, or change them or, or do whatever you want. But this is a way to sort of take the data and create a, a statement uh, about each student uh, for uh, a reporting term. So here goes this one. The column headings containing the student statements have an adjective, a succeeding, a developmental, and a goal for each term. 
The cells underneath have drop down lists that have customized statements based on student performance. This communicates with the tabs at the bottom for the narrative statements. These can be modified and changed. Because I teach both elementary and middle school, the tabs at the bottom will indicate a lower school narrative or a middle school narrative statement, along with which term I'm going to make that statement in. This way, I'm not saying the same thing about the same students year after year. I also have a column that indicates who has siblings that I also teach so that I can make different statements about siblings. When you've selected the correct comments for each student, you can run your Autocrat mail merge. The Autocrat wizard will take you step by step through the process of the merge. You will have already created a Google Doc template that looks like this. This is the document that will communicate with the Excel spreadsheet. Within each statement, the words in brackets are the column headings from the Google Sheet. It will input the data for each student into that statement. And you click through, select whichever class or grade that you want to do the merge for, name your file, and this will be a Google Doc. It will be one Google Doc with all statements about each student in that class in one document. You will not share this or email this to anyone. When it's all finished, it'll create one document that you can click on, open up, and it should have each customized statement for every student in that class. These statements can then be cut and pasted into report card systems or printed and cut and delivered to parents. So, and again, I know it's a lot, but those statements, once they are you know, processed and put out, uh, you can come up with some pretty uh, colorful um, statements for your students. Um, and it, it helps your parents know that, hey, this, this teacher really knows uh, my kid, and that, and that goes a long way with, with relationships. So that is the gist of my presentation. And again, here are some additional resources that you can explore, uh, more resources, uh, some Twitter stuff to look into if you are really want to, if you really want to dive deep into standards based, there are a lot of resources out there uh, to use. But again, this is just a starting point. Uh, hopefully, this is a way that you can take a look at what I've presented and figure out, okay, this is what I want to put some time into. And it, it does, it takes a long time. So uh, baby steps in the process. Again, I've been sort of putting these things into practice for about six or seven years. And this is the point that, I, that I'm currently at. And I'm sure I'm going to be uh, changing some things along the way. Um, if nothing else, I hope that these ideas will plant a seed in your head. Maybe you don't act on them this summer. Uh, or even next year, but maybe you start to think about, okay, this is this might work in my situation. Um, and then maybe in a year or two from now, you have made that conversion and you're really um, establishing your program in a standards-based approach. Uh, when, at least for me, when I was able to, to take it from a traditional, you know, points and, and uh, categories and this and that uh, into a, a standards-based approach at my school, other teachers saw that it could be done and then it inspired them to change what they do in their particular content area, music teachers and, and uh, science teachers uh, sort of took what I had done and said, okay, this is gonna work for me as well. And they started to select their standards and, and their priorities uh, for assessment and, and they built their, um, they rebuilt their program out. Now my school is not standards-based yet, but they're starting to see what I and other teachers have done, and they're starting to figure out, okay, how do we get to that point, but still you know, have a, a, a grade point average or, or whatever they feel is important for the secondary placement school. So that's where we're at, and I hope you have learned a little bit of something along the way. And again, I'm here to answer any questions or provide you with any resources you might need. So thank you very much for your time. Take care.